I didn't think we had any room to debate what it meant to be major versus minor. I mean, every music school in the world has been teaching it the same way for hundreds of years. But when Jacob Collier was in France giving a master class, he took it a step further. Well, I have a theory, uh, which is that all major chords are fifths, and all minor chords are fourths. I'm not sure what we're supposed to make of this. Jacob is one of the best musicians of my generation, so I'm inclined to believe him. But I need to spend some more time with this in order to be convinced. So is Jacob right about all this? Has he just discovered an alternative way to look at stuff that we already know? If Jacob's discovery has any merit, does this open any new doors for us to walk through? We can take any random note on the piano. Let's start with C. And we're gonna go up a perfect fifth. That gives us a G. And from there, we can repeat this pattern. We can go from G up to D. And we can continue this up. At some point, we're going to get back to the C that we started on. So this line of fifths that we have drawn is actually a circle of fifths. If you look closely, this circle of fifths has all 12 of our notes in it. They're not in the chromatic order. They're ordered in fifths, but all 12 of the notes are there. So we don't have 12 different circles. We don't have a different circle for every key. All of the keys use the same circle. We just rotate our circle of fifths to put whatever note we want to start with up at the top. According to Jacob, our major sounds come from this stuff over here on the right side of the circle. And we could do a number of different things with that. For example, we could create a chord progression that plays through these notes in sequence. We could be using these as melodic options. Any of these notes would work in a C major harmony. After all, these notes right here are the C pentatonic scale. We could also take a simple C major triad and we can make it a more robust sounding C major chord simply by adding any of these notes to it. So I think I buy Jacob's explanation that all this stuff here on the right is major stuff. And it's more than just mathematically or theoretically interesting. I think this is a really practical way to think about it. So since all this stuff over here in the right is major, does that mean that all this stuff over here on the left is minor? Jacob is very clear. That is exactly what he is saying. In fact, he's going so far as to say that the minor stuff here is just an upside down version of the major stuff over here. And this is where I want to dig in quite a bit deeper. So if we start on C and we go up a perfect fifth, we get G. We just talked about that. But if we start on C and go down to G, we don't get a perfect fifth, we get a perfect fourth. So Jacob's right, this perfect fourth is an upside down version of this perfect fifth. And using that same logic, Jacob wants us to think about this minor stuff over here as being an upside down version of this major stuff. As we know, we can create chord progressions and cadences here using the major side. But Jacob says we can use those same movements and cadences on this side of the circle to get the minor version of them. When I play with this, I can hear what Jacob means. When I stack perfect fifths on top of each other over here, things get brighter, they feel lighter, they feel like they're opening up. And when I play with stuff on this side, using perfect fourths instead of fifths, things feel like they're darker, like they're closing in on you. In my classical training, we call this stuff perfect. Like a perfect cadence is a cadence that goes from five to one. And the stuff on this side, we would have called plagal, the cadence that goes from four to one. This is the classic amen cadence that you would have heard in church. I spent a lot of years of my life as an organist in the United Methodist Church, and I played a lot of plagal cadences, even when the hymns were major. So I understand perfect cadences, plagal cadences, but I'm not totally sold yet that this is major and this is minor. So if we set Jacob's theory aside here for just a second, let's just think about what it means to be minor. So if we're in the key of C, the most important note we have to determine if we're minor is the third. C major would have an E natural, and C minor would have an E flat. And that E flat is right here prominently in the center of the left side of the circle. There are two other notes that are really important in a minor sound. One of those would be this flat six, the A flat, and the other one would be this flat seven, the B flat. So you notice all of these important notes are here on the left side. So if we're playing in a minor key, this left side is familiar territory for us. 
One of my favorite moments of Jacob's masterclass is his explanation about how the direction you move around the circle determines whether or not you're getting brighter or getting darker. If you're moving from the dark side towards the bright side, your sound is going to get brighter. If you're moving from the bright side down to the dark side, it's going to get darker. And if you look at the way a lot of our traditional songs work, they resolve this way through perfect cadences, two, five, ones and stuff to take us back home. And things tend to close down and get darker when we do that. But Jacob says we could kind of do the opposite resolution. Instead of going from bright to dark and ending up here, we could go from dark to bright. And instead of our song feeling like it's closing down as it gets closer to home, it feels like it's opening up when we get home. Because the, if, you, if you move anti-clockwise, then you're, you're, you're getting darker, yeah? You're getting darker. You're going D, G, C. It's like, and we're resolving, right? As opposed to plaguely, it's like we're dark and we're going to open. And you can actually, you can even start being a plagal cadence from E, which is really weird because instead of going E, A, D, G, C, you can go E. And it's something so elegant about that. Don't, don't you think it's cool? As a jazz pianist, I like to extend my chords with nines, elevens, and thirteens, but we have to be a little careful when we add the eleven to the major chord. See, if we add the 11, which is an F, to C major, we get a pretty harsh clash. And if we look at the circle, we can see that F is up here on the minor side in a really prominent position. It's actually best practice for us to use a sharp 11 down here instead. But when we play a minor chord, we definitely do want to use the natural 11 we extended. And it makes sense, because it's here on the minor stuff. Now never in all of my years of training has somebody told me which notes to play and not play on a chord because of where they fall on the circle of fifths. This is completely new to me. But nonetheless, it's interesting to see this plotted on Jacob's circle. When we look at this from Jacob's perspective, it's very clear why I would not play a natural 11 on a major chord, just on the wrong side of the circle. So down in the comments, I want you to tell me, is this a great idea or do you think this is just a bunch of Jacob music theory bumbo jumbo? I'm gonna go on the record and say that I think there's a lot of merit to it and I'm gonna give it my stamp of approval. But just like everything we do when we create music, these are not hard and fast rules that we follow all the time. We never want to declare ourselves wrong for using a 4-1 cadence in a major hymn. We do that all the time. But as a general way of framing major versus minor, I think Jacob has some interesting ideas here. So I think that rather than say this note, yeah, rather than say this note is good and this note is bad, it's, it's more this note hasn't found its consequence yet, or this note is in the wrong context. Um, and, and then that's how you can move things forward. But I don't think you should ever um, reject a note from a chord before trying all of the possible solutions to that chord. And, and as far as how do you know if it's right or wrong, I think you just, you, you know because you can hear it. Um, and if it feels right, then it's probably fine. To see Jacob take these ideas and put them in practice in a real song, I'm gonna suggest you watch this video on Fix You, his cover of the Coldplay song. He uses these ideas in the accompaniment all over the place, and it has perhaps the coolest common tone modulation I have ever heard. 